Good morning. Uh, welcome to our uh, workshop this morning. Uh, my name is Tony Garcia. I am a member of the Tier 1 Steering Committee, also a board member of the uh, Monta Vista Historical Association, and also a member of the newly formed Cities IDZ Task Force Committee. We got some housekeeping notes here. We have uh, coffee and cookies in the kitchen, and of course the bathrooms are located in the back of the room. And please make sure you have signed in, indicating, indicating your neighborhood association and the district that you live in. Also, when you participate in other events other than Tier 1, we ask that you sign in with both your neighborhood association as well as your affiliation with the Tier 1 Neighborhood uh, Coalition. We have a couple of additional announcements. As we have done in previous meetings, we are asking for donations. We are launching our new Tier 1 website as well as a social media campaign very soon, so any donation would help in defraying some of the costs. Uh, tier 1 would like to thank uh, Janie Barrera and the Lyft Fund staff for their generosity in hosting our meeting, especially on a Saturday morning. Also, we would like to introduce a couple individuals that are in attendance. First of all, we would like to start out with Ms. Melissa Ramirez. Assistant Director of Development Services uh, Department, who will be saying a few words before we start our presentation. We have Tony Feltz, Internal Policy Administrator from uh, Development Services Department as well. We have Chrissy McLean from District One Office in the back room. And then we have uh, uh, George Lagarza, an architect, who's also uh, a member of the IDZ Task Force Committee. Finally, uh, we are seeking volunteers for the Tier 1 Steering Committee, especially from our west side neighborhoods. Represent representation of all neighborhood areas is key to a transparent dialogue. We meet on a monthly basis to discuss potential solutions to neighborhood issues and plan programs which promote our mission statement. Our mission statement being that the Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition is a group of San Antonio neighborhoods inside Route 410 organized to advocate and work for appropriate development, as well as other important issues that affect our communities. Our mission is to promote, is to promote communication, cooperation, education, and support among our neighborhoods. Today's event is about education and the opportunity to voice your opinion on a matter that affects your neighborhood. The current infill development zoning, IDZ, has been very problematic <clears throat> for in inner city neighborhoods. In many areas of our city, IDZ has been received with mixed reviews, mostly welcomed by developers and mostly vilified by neighborhoods who have experienced the negative resi uh, residual effects after the development has been completed. We won't forget about the past, but today's workshop is about the future the future of the new IDZ draft proposals that can further shape, can, that can be further shaped by neighborhood involvement, your involvement. So this morning, we ask that you focus on the presentation, listen, learn, ask questions, express concerns, and submit any recommendations for changes this morning or in the near future as these proposals go further in the review process. Without further delay, I would like to present Melissa Rodriguez, Kat Hernandez, Development Services Administrator, and Logan Sparrow, Principal Planner, both from the City's Development Services Department. Thank you. Yay! Melissa. Thank Do I need that? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, um, again, I am Melissa Ramirez. I'm the Assistant Director for Development Services Department, Land Development. So thank you for your time and effort that you spend with us on our task force. Uh, today, Logan and Catherine will be going over, Kat, as many of you know, in formal settings, I call her Catherine. Um, but uh, she, is, she will be going over the IDZ amendments that we're talking about that I know many of you have worked hard to participate in.
And if you have any questions, please feel free to um, answer that. I also brought Tony Feltz along with us. He is our interim policy administrator. He has been helping us with the short-term rental. I do not want to take away from your agenda today, but at the end of this, if you have any questions on that, we're here to help you understand where we're at in the process and where we're going. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Kat. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what brought us here. Uh, this is actually going to be our first uh, general public meeting to introduce the revisions that have been put forward by the task force. In the slide, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. In the slide, um, we'll also feature who the task force member, members were, so you can see those uh, members of your community that took part in uh, the revisions and came uh, up with what we're doing to kind of fix uh, IDZ as well as some other options for development. All right, it's already on. Okay, so again, we'll go over the background of how we got here. Uh, we'll go over the new versions of IDZ. We've created three different options to address the different types of projects that we have seen since IDZ was created in 2001. Uh, we'll go over the new options called R1 and R2, and I'll go into detail about that. Uh, our mixed use uh, district is our a current MXD district is a current uh, Dis-zoning district in our Unified Development Code, and we've done some uh, proposed revisions to try to fix that to give um, mixed, large mixed-use scale projects another opportunity to utilize a zoning district that already exists instead of IDZ. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the land use categories that the planning department has uh, been working on and how these new districts fit in with that. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions. So um, last year, council members from uh, council districts one and seven did a CCR for uh, development staff, uh, development services staff to review our IDZ um, and make sure that it maintains that neighborhood compatibility when utilized and approved by city council. Um, because again, there were a lot of concerns related to uh, the current regulations or lack of regulations in IDZ that uh, we're not sensitive to uh, the neighborhood. So our task force that we put together was a mixture of those that utilize IDZ for projects and the communities that have experienced a lot of IDZ rezonings. Uh, so uh, we had members from our development community from Pape Dawson, which is Tom Carter, uh, Alamo Architects, Irby Hightower. I'm sure you know Jim Bailey, who's been part of the housing task force, the mayor's housing task force. Irby and uh, Jim worked together. Um, we actually asked Jim to participate, but because he got pulled to the housing task force, he asked Irby to step in. Uh, James McKnight from Brown and Ortiz, uh, they are a lobbyist, uh, also representative uh, for zoning cases that have uh, represented clients utilizing IDZ. John Cooley from Terramark, Terramark Homes has uh, quite a few IDZ projects, especially in the Dignity Hill area, uh, so they were part of that process as well. Russell Yeager from Big Red Dog, Frank Burney, uh, Frank Patrick, I'm always going to sl slaughter his name. Pakachewski, I think it is. Um, we had Ben Fairbank from Tobin Hill. He's here. Uh, Celsa Gonzalez from Lavaca Neighborhood Association. She has since stepped off as president, and um, someone else has stepped in on her place. Tony Garcia, of course, from Monta Vista. Nick Rivard from Dignity Hill. Teresa Banias, who's, who's here too. She was also part of our task force. Uh, Susan Powers, Lone Star. George Dolagarza, he's here. There he is. And of course, Kristen McCain was part of that process because uh, D one help to sponsor that CCR. So just to kind of highlight what those revisions to IDZ captured, uh, we, we came out of this process with three big things, three big takeaways for IDZ. More site plan requirements. Um, they're similar to our conditional use and specific use authorizations. The problem that had existed with IDZ projects was the lack of uh, site plan requirements. So you don't know what you're going to get in the end. All you saw on a site plan were three things that were required. Where your streets are, where your driveways are proposed, 
proposed and the uses that would be required. But you didn't know where the building was going to get situated. You didn't know where the parking was going to be situated if they were going to provide parking. You didn't know where your buffers were going to be. You didn't know if there were going to be any fencing um, options that were going to be there. So we, um, with the task force, are proposing now uh, site plan requirements, again, similar to how, what we have, and they're very detailed in our conditional use and specific use authorization processes. We now also have a maximum height for our uh, two new districts, IDZ1 and IDZ2, um, depending upon the density. I feel like I need to lower this, yeah, maybe? Yeah, okay. Um, and then we also had side perimeter setbacks. Uh, currently, IDZ, the only setback that it has is front, which is um, a median of the block face, rear, which is five feet, and no side setbacks. However, fire code requires that there be a setback, a minimum setback of five feet. So the projects were doing five feet towards the end anyway. Uh, so now we have required perimeter setbacks. And lastly, uh, we also are now introducing more minimum parking requirements. Um, again, allowing you to relax some of the minimum parking requirements by 50% for your uh, larger, the medium intensity and uh, high intensity projects, but still requiring parking now because that was a big issue and concern that was discussed. So IDZ1, we'll go over a little, uh, some of the accomplishments or some of the new uh, standards that we are introducing. Uh, IDZ1 is going to be uh, called our low intensity. So these are going to this IDZ1 is going to be utilized for the less the, the least dense type projects and the least amount of commercial type services being offered. So these are going to be the ones that we're going to encourage right adjacent to your neighborhood or if it's just a single family home or a duplex home within the neighborhood, especially if you have um, a substandard lot that doesn't meet your typical uh, conventional zoning district requirements. Uh, so the residential uses, there's a limitation of up to 18 units per acre. Um, Non-residential non uses can be introduced for IDZ1 if you're doing sort of like a mixed use project, but the most intense type of uses that you would be allowed to request would be uses permitted in C1 or O1. So the O1 is your typical office district, and C1 is your lightest commercial district. So you'll have small scale restaurants, uh, you'll have um, dry cleaning operation, pickup operations, haircut places. Uh, C1 has a building square footage limitation of 5,000 square feet. So these are for your small commercial lots. Uh, so that's why the intensity it only goes up to C1 for IDZ1. Um, there is that requirement for a site plan. Again, as, as I talked about earlier, it's going to be consistent with our conditional use and specific use authorization requirements. We are uh, building into the ordinance uh, that the site plan requirement would be waived if you're just doing a single family home. We recognize that we get a lot of mom and pop applicants that come in, all they wanna do is just build their home on a small lot. So they come in, they request uh, to do either a conditional use, and now they have to come up with a site plan requirement. Or if they come in, they request IDZ. Well, there's barely a site plan requirement, but this would help to accommodate you, especially if it's just a single family home. As long as you maintain the minimum setbacks that are now that would be required now with this revision, then you really don't need to know exactly where that home is going to be placed because it's going to be typical to the rest of the block. Uh, there also is a height limitation now introduced into IDZ1 of two and a half stories, 35 feet. This is consistent with all of our single family residential districts, R4, R5, R6, um, even our neighborhood preservation districts. So all of the single family residential districts have this height uh, limitation. Um, we also are maintaining the front setback within 10% of the block face median, so that way um, they, it gives them a little bit of flexibility of 10%, but it still maintains uh, that block face that has already been established in those older neighborhoods. There are still, for projects that maybe they're going to do two, three, again, you get up to 18 units per acre. No interior <coughs> side setbacks for the residential interior lot, so if you have a project, you can go as close as you can as long as you maintain fire code requirements, but for the perimeter, the perimeter means that it's on the on the outside or um, of the of the project area adjacent to somebody else's property. That side setback requirement will be required to have a five foot setback. Uh, so that way we maintain that distance uh, separation between the project and the next door neighbor. 
And then of course we're still maintaining the rear setback of five feet. IDZ1 will still waive the minimum off-street parking requirements because again, IDZ1 is your, your, is your, your least intense uh, IDZ project. IDZ1, here's an example of what uh, site plan requirements that we would be getting now. So again, if the applicant seeks to build a duplex, this example shows that site plan to show where the structure is. Logan, if you want to kind of uh, point out the features since you're closest, and that way they can see what is shown on this site plan. Yeah, sure. So again, this is the same sort of site plan that we've required for years now whenever an applicant requests a conditional or a specific use request. So unlike the current IDZ regulations where you only have to show the ingress, egress, location of uses and streets, in this example you would have to list the dimensions of the building, the height of the building, what its set backs are going to be. So with this type of uh, site plan, when the applicant is working with the neighborhood, they're reaching out, the neighborhood has a much better idea of what is proposed to be built on that lot versus you know, the, the IDZ site plan that's required today. So now we'll go into IDZ2. IDZ2 is now your medium intensity type of uh, project. Uh, so in this case, for residential uses, you'll get up to 50 units per acre. Uh, the non-residential uses that you can do on this type of uh, request, again, if you're doing a mixed-use project, would be uses as intense as C2, also known as a more or less our retail type commercial district, and 01.5, which is higher height, but still a professional office type district. Uh, again, the requirement for a site plan is still the same. So you still have to do a site plan. The height now is limited, gives you a little bit more flexibility to go higher, but it is limited to four stories. Um, in addition, you also have to show your front setback. So part of this process now will in introduce not only the site plan, but you're also going to have to do a, a, a ground plan comparison form. And then Logan will go into that in the next slide. Uh, so again, it's just additional requirements as you get more intense uh, with IDZ. Uh, there's still no interior side setbacks, but still you have to maintain that perimeter, perimeter side setback of five feet. Uh, you still have your rear setback of five, of five feet, and now we're introducing parking requirements. You'll still have to meet 50% of the minimum parking requirements for a project. So here is that example, and Logan can go into that. Sure, so one of the concerns we had from members of the task force, and we'd heard it from members of the community as well, is we'd like to have a better idea of the context of the project compared to what the, the community that it's going to be built in. So we had certain task force members, they tracked down a similar form that the city of Denver uses. So if you have a proposed infill project, we want you to list, you know, of course, the addresses and what is the setback to the structure, the setback to the front porch if you're going to have one the side setbacks and the building height compared to the same standards of the properties surrounding it. So again, this is, I went ahead and I filled this one in as an example. So we have a proposed infill project with a 10 foot front setback, five foot side setbacks, and it's gonna be 30 feet tall is what they're proposing. But in this example, the properties at D and E are 20 and 19 feet tall. So that helps the neighborhood, that helps neighborhood associations, developers, and the council office say, you know, if the properties to either side of it are 19, 20 feet tall, is it really appropriate that this one is going to be 30 feet tall? Would 25 or would 20 be more appropriate? So it's just more information for the community uh, so that they can be more involved, have a better idea of what that property is going to look like when it's developed. And as Kat mentioned, with IDZ2, they're required to fill this out in addition to the same site plan requirement that you're required to fill out for IDZ1. So the more you ask for, the more you have to provide. All right, so now we're going to go into IDZ3. IDZ3 will be our most intense or the high intensity uh, district that is being proposed. Um, so the residential density is not capped in this uh, category. However, you have to state it in the, in the ordinance. So as we do today, IDZ with multifamily uses not to exceed 65 units per acre. That would be the same type of requirement that we would do. So that way they're limited in that approval process based on what's approved as part of the ordinance. Um, Non-residential uses can be introduced as a mixed-use project, so now you can go up to C3, or which is our most intense commercial district, O2, which is our highest office uh, district, it's most intense because it has unlimited height, and I1, your light industrial district, so this allows you to do those type of uses with IDZ. 
um, you still have that requirement to submit a site plan. In addition, you still have the requ you will also have the requirement in IDZ2 to have that ground plan comparison form. And now you'll also have to do a 3D massing model. So, and, and Logan will go into that in the next slide. The height is not limited in this type of um, category, but however, it must be shown on the site plan, that comparison form in the massing model. And that will be approved as part of the ordinance and that will be their limitation based on that approval. Front setback has to be shown on that as well. So whatever that front setback is, is stated and approved as part of that site plan, that's the most that they get. Uh, no interior side setbacks for the project, but you still have to maintain that five foot perimeter side setback, rear setback of five feet. And again, you only get to waive up to 50% of the min minimum parking requirements. And here's that massing model. So in addition to the site plan requirement and the ground plan comparison form that we discussed previously, uh, we had a couple folks say, you know, if you're seeking IDZ3, you're probably talking about a relatively dense, it's a pretty intense project, it's got C3 commercial uses. So we had several folks propose uh, a 3D massing model, and they were very specific, and the ordinance is written such that this model, I mean, unlike this one, doesn't have to show all the specific architectural details. So in this model, we're not trying to tie the developer to, you know, exactly, you know, those sort of windows and the door and all that. It's really, think of rectangles, right? So in blue is what's proposed, and what this is for is to get a, a better understanding of, in white, the community around it. What is the project going to look like in its massing effect? in the community in which it's going to be placed. Uh, so part of the process, um, uh, some of the discussion related to IDZ was that IDZ was utilized for a lot of the very small lots that didn't meet the minimum a lot area requirements. So our residential districts start with R3. You have to have a minimum of 3,000 square feet. We have a lot of lots in the inner city that do not meet 3,000 square feet. So they were requesting IDZ because IDZ only requires a 1,250 square feet for a detached single family home. That's why they were coming in for IDZ for a single family home, because they weren't able to build a home on a normally zoned R4, R5, or R6 lots. And, and just for your reference, the numbers in those residential districts, three, four, five, and six, uh, means a square foot requirements. So three is 3,000, four is 4,000, five is 5,000, and six is, is 6,000. Those are the square footage requirements for each type of lot in order for it to be developed as a single family home. So again, these projects or these single family homes could meet that minimum requirement. So they were requesting IDZ because that's the only option out there. So the discussion with the task force was, well, maybe we need to have another option that they could request that's more conventional, more traditional, um, like our R3, R4, R5, and R6. So we came up with R1 and R2. Um, so uh, the R1 and R2 would be available throughout the city because we recognize that there might be some developments that uh, would be good in our regional centers that are outside of 410. Because in case I didn't mention it earlier, IDZ is only available inside Loop 410 because it's called the infill development zone. That's where our infill areas are. So we came up with the R2 and R1 version. R2 means, again, the, the two means 2,000 square foot minimum lot size requirement. You will have a front setback of 10 feet, side setback of five, rear setback of five. Your maximum height you're limited to is three stories, 35 feet, which is similar to our residential mixed districts, our RM4, RM5, and RM6. And your maximum lot coverage basically is 50%. R1, now you can go a little bit less with square footage. Minimum lot size is uh, 1250 square feet, similar to IDZ. This is going to be a little different. I know one, normally two, three, four, five, and six is an even number, but we want it to be consistent with our lowest, our, uh, or yeah, IDZ, which is already 1250. Again, front setback 10 feet, side setback five, rear five, maximum height three stories, 35 feet, and their maximum lot coverage is 45%. And again, th these would be a traditional conventional zoning district that you'll find in our uh, lot and building specifications table in UDC if approved by council. Just another option instead of requesting IDZ in the middle of a block. Um, so 
as we went further to talk about um, large-scale mixed-use projects that have been utilizing IDZ, especially within Loop 410, because that was the only availability to do these large-scale uh, mixed-use projects, like, for example, the Pearl. Pearl zoned IDZ. IDZ was, was the only option that would fit or that would work for that type of development because our other mixed-use development uh, districts did not have the flexibility that IDZ had. Uh, so they came up with, a, we, we discussed what do we need to do, what do we need to fix what we have in order to have that available option instead of requesting IDZ. Because again, IDZ is limited within 410, so you can't utilize uh, IDZ outside of 410. And mixed, the MXD was not being utilized a, a lot outside of 410. So the task force looked at our current MXD uh, district and created some uh, revisions to it that would fix that district. So the mixed use development now uh, requires a site plan, but one of the new things that we uh, introduced, because again, the mixed use di uh, district site plan requirement, you would show where your uses are going. Now you can show your height. The height requirement allows, uh, through the, the approval process, through that negotiation process, allows council to place limitations on the height based on those discussions with the neighborhood. So now that you put the height on the site plan, now you can limit the site plan I limit the height on the site plan through that approval process because right now the height's not shown on MXD. Um, you must provide at least a five foot rear setback. However, that setback will grow if you are adjacent to single family residential uses. So it's extended to at least 25 feet away uh, where the non-residential use is adjacent to a single family use. And then we also introduced some height restrictions where if it was within 50 feet of a single family home, they were limited to the same height restriction that that single family home has. Uh, so that way it, it's, it's scaled appropriately adjacent to a single family home. So here's a, an example of the site plan for MXD. True. So this is a pretty typical mixed use development site plan. So the difference that we would have as part of our ordinance is not only would you have to show, you know, in blue is going to be office space, yellow is going to be multifamily, but you would, as Kat mentioned, have to have corresponding height. So, you know, obviously in this situation, we kind of have all this green belt over here, but, you know, if you had a single family subdivision next door, they'd have to say, you know, I want this to be, these buildings on the side to be 50 feet tall, and that's when, through part of the negotiation and working between developer and neighborhood association and commission and council, they could say, well, you know, we're all right with the plan, but, you know, we'd like to see these buildings be a little shorter. Please indicate that, and that way, Again, as she mentioned, you're tied to it as part of the zoning. So it gives uh, the neighborhoods a little more voice in a process when we're working with our development community to make sure that we have projects that fit. So now we'll talk a little bit about the land use categories. So as you know, planning department is currently updating the land use categories that would be approved by council, I think, in the next month. Um, it requires a UDC amendment because our land use categories are built into our uh, definitions, Appendix A of Chapter 35. Um, and these new categories are going to be utilized for all the new plans that they're working on as part of SA tomorrow. Uh, so we know that the land use categories are going to be approved by council first. Then we're, we're, we still have the steps to go through the public hearing process and the adoption process for these new districts and the new versions of IDZ 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so once we do that, then we'll coordinate with our planning department to do what we call a RID. Uh, we'll fit the new districts into the new land use category, sort of like an interpretation. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the text of those land use categories, because if you read the text of the new land use categories, they have a density limitation, they have an intensity limitation, and so our new districts will, co will correspond with that. So if the density limitation is 18 units per acre, IDZ1 would be consistent with that. If the density limitation is 50, IDZ2 would be consistent with that. Uh, so it's just going to depend on what the text says for those new land use categories, and then we'll fit them in. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. Again, just focus on the text for those, focus on the, limita the, the, the intensity limitations, the density limitations, and that's where you'll find uh, where these new districts would be introduced to if approved by council. 
Uh, so our timeline moving forward, um, we do have another community meeting on Monday uh, to do the, do the same thing that we're doing today. We're going to present the same presentation uh, that we're doing today on Monday. So those that couldn't come today who, who want to come on Monday, um, we're wel we welcome that. So we'll have two community meetings to introduce these new revisions. Where's that going to be? Our one-stop center in our boardroom. And hopefully our board of adjustment meeting will be over before that. It'll be at 6.30. Um, so then we also go to TAC on June 29th. TAC is our technical advisory uh, committee from our planning commission. TAC has to review all UDC amendments before moving forward through the commission approval process and council approval process. Following TAC, we'll go to planning commission <clears throat> in July. Then we'll follow up with zoning commission in August. And by August, September, because remember, council's on, on a break for the budget development process. August, September, then we'll go to the comprehensive planning committee, which is a subcommittee of the city council and then city council for uh, full consideration all right well that's pretty much it do we have any questions yes ma'am I do uh, Logan, uh, you want to give do you need the mic for the questions so you can record them oh that's okay I can speak loud <laughs> but you need it for the yeah oh, they need it. yeah okay. hold the top hold the bottom it should be on already. Hello. Okay. Yes. Okay, I got it right. <laughs> uh, Logan, you mentioned um, at one juncture in this that this is where the neighborhood associations would have um, uh, a place to uh, negotiate. So, so a neighborhood, so neighborhood associations then would have to uh, be organized and super proactive to be able to negotiate and so and then the planning commission and the zoning commission aren't necessarily they don't necessarily have the backs of those neighborhood associations because so many of them just go by what the rules are and justify it that way so where do you where do you see this I mean is your staff going to be uh, informing the applicants about the neighborhood association or informing them that they need to meet with the neighborhood association or and how will that be sure. handled? Sure, so, okay. Initially, whenever we have an applicant come into our department and they express interest in trying to rezone a property, you know, we're looking at various things. We're looking at, you know, what is the future land use plan? You know, what is a reasonable request? One of the other things we're always looking at is the neighborhood association. We always recommend that our applicants reach out to a neighborhood association. Um, now, as far as the neighborhood association getting involved in that process, one of the concerns that we had, or one of the concerns that we heard from neighborhoods is, the way IDZ is written today, it doesn't offer much of, there's, n there's nothing to really hold a developer's feet to the fire, so to speak. So they could come in and say, well, here's a conceptual rendering and, and all that, but there was nothing in the site plan that really tied them to what they were saying. And that led, not only, that was frustrating for neighborhoods, but it was also frustrating for developers, because you had developers that had a very sincere intent to develop exactly what they were communicating, but there was this apprehension, you know, is it really gonna look like what it's gonna look like? So what we envisioned with this process, with more detailed site plans, with massing models, with comparison forms, is it gives the teeth to the ordinance. It says that if this is what's approved, that is what they are going to be tied to. So what we envision as part of the negotiation, so to speak, is now you have something concrete that they, you really can say, you know, I, I don't know if 35 feet is appropriate, we'd be more comfortable with 25 feet, and you know 25 feet would be what they're capped at as part of the ordinance. So it offers that predictability. And then if I can chime in, our rezoning process requires notification. Uh, state, and, state law and our U UDC require notification to property owners within 200 feet. And then our UDC, we also notified neighborhood associations that are registered with the city uh, within 200 feet of that project. So they'll get a notification early on in that process. We also have um, a 
we post our reports online. So if you, uh, our constant contact is our, is our application right now that we utilize, so where you can sign up to receive notifications. We have what's called a tentative zoning report that we post, which is about a week after uh, the deadline for zoning cases. And so uh, you're able to go online, download that report, and see uh, zoning cases that have been applied for. And that's well in advance of the notification that any property owner or neighborhood association would receive. Uh, so on the DSD website, and we'll show you that, um, it's, uh, there's a little icon that says email. So the software application that we utilize is Constant Contact. Okay, e-news, e e thank you. Oh, yes, anyone has access to that. It's a PDF report. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So I like the changes. But on, for example, IDZ1, so it goes up to 18. And so we have an acre of land. So when we get the site plan, and I know it, there's no parking requested, do you look at the site plan to see if there's any place to park? You know, we're in a very tiny neighborhood from River Road. So even though it doesn't request it, if you're building something new on an acre of land, and there's really no street parking, what should we do? Will you take that in consideration when you're evaluating that? Well, so since the requirement is not there to provide parking, uh, we wouldn't look to see if they have room to park. However, if they show in their site plan that they are going to park, then they have to meet our minimum parking requirements. I would say 90 to 95% of our projects that come in park park it because they can't market it without parking. Um, it, it Maybe in the downtown area or close to the downtown area where IDZ is used and it's not zone D, would that be more appropriate because then you have maybe parking garage or shared parking structures? Uh, but for many of the rezoning requests do meet the minimal parking requirements because they can't market it without the parking. Okay, and the second one, little question, just a technicality. We usually describe 35 feet by 2.5 stories and it, you flip around, sometimes you have you know, three stories for 35 feet. Are you gonna be consistent with 2.5 and 35 feet or it depends on? Well, I mean, again, this is their option. Two and a half stories, they can do two and a half stories, it's just you cannot exceed 35 feet in height. Okay. That's, that's what the 35 feet reference is. Right, you just change language in your slides. Sometimes you have three stories. Yeah. Oh, because that is the requirement. <clears throat> so for IDZ1, uh -huh. it's only two and a half stories. So think of your uh, two story with a dormer window on the top. Uh, so that's two and a half stories, that is their limitation. For the R1 and R2, it is three stories. It is three, it stories. Is three stories, but still capped at 35 feet. Make sure, yeah. okay. Mr. Uh, Michael Shannon has walked in. He's our Director of Development Services Department. Welcome. <laughs> there is no exit, though. <laughs> I think she has. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me ask a question because you're on slide number uh, IDC. Uh, the city's definition of uh, median block face front setback, what does that actually mean? Uh, because we know that setbacks for infield development has always been, front setbacks has always been an issue. Sure. So when we're talking about the block face setback, what we, so let's say you have you know, grid street infrastructure. So we're going to be looking at all the homes along that street in just that block on just that side of the street. So, yeah, and I'll walk over here. So let's pretend this street had only three homes on it. So we would be averaging, you'd take the front setback of, you know, the, if, and again, assuming this is a vacant lot, you'd be looking at just the properties on that side of the street, not the other ones on the other side, in between two other streets. So if, just to keep math simple, if you had a 10 foot and a 10 foot front setback, then of course the median would be 10 meaning that if your IDZ1 had to be within 10%, you could have between a nine and an 11 foot front setback. And again, as Kat mentioned, the idea there is that you give some flexibility to the development, but that it's not giving so much flexibility that it detracts from the neighborhood. I, I know we had one question waiting up here. I promise to get to you next. This is related to exactly what you're asking. Okay. So we had an incident in Beacon Hill where the city decided that the front overhang porch was the, I'm sorry. Um, we had an incident in Beacon Hill where 
uh, development services determined that the front overhang of the porch was the setback, not the actual building. So what will what constitutes a setback? So the setback is going to be to the front wall of the home. Uh, so, or the post, whichever comes first. So if you think of it <clears throat> in terms of a carport, um, if the carport is in front of the uh, front wall of the home, the front plane, that's, that's where their uh, setback starts, if you will. You have, you have a minimum setback that you have to meet from your lot line to um, whatever that is, 20 feet or 10 feet. And if your post is five feet from that, uh, you still have about five feet to play with. So it's, it's the front wall of the home. Uh, what you're referring to is that um, um, some of our NCDs had been written uh, to where uh, you do an, a sort of like a elevation view, and um, the elevation view would not capture to the front wall. It would capture to the overhang of that front porch, which eventually created this creep of setbacks going further and further because your overhang continues to grow or get closer to the street. So as we've been modifying our neighborhood conservation districts, we've been recognizing that and defining that it needs to meet the front wall of the setback. Uh, so that would be uh, what we would utilize for this process. It's the front wall or the post, whichever is closer. Uh, yeah, I had. Well, she's had her hand up for a long time. <laughs> we'll have to take numbers here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I would like to add a little something to what uh, this lady had to say about the the parking. In the, uh, for, I'm most familiar with King William and Lavaca. A good number of those homes do not even have a driveway. Mm -hmm. They certainly don't have a garage. That means that the owners of the homes, the only parking places they have is on the streets. Well, if you uh, uh, authorize these people to only have the, half the parking that they might need for their business or their activity, you put another burden again on the neighborhood because we not only have our own cars to contend with, but we have many, many downtown employees that come and park on our streets. Uh, in our case, we the first five streets or so, we've had to restrict parking to one side of the street because emergency vehicles cannot get through. I mean, 50% is, for us, that's very little. When we, that's our only parking place. The other thing I wanted to, to ask about is, when I hear that um, up to eight, units is considered low, well, that's like living next door to a miniature, a mini, a mini motel. Uh, it, it just ruins several decades of effort that has gone on to build these neighborhoods into something beautiful. I, I just cannot imagine living next door to a motel. But that's what that, that adds up to in my mind. So regarding 18 units an acre, because I, I understand the 18 number sounds pretty high. So I mean, IDZ, this is our infill development zone. And it is oftentimes applied to parcels that, for one reason or another, it is difficult or impossible to develop on with a conventional zoning district. So it relaxes setbacks, it reduces parking. If you were to take a 6,000 square foot lot, a typical residential single family sized lot, it's about 6,000 square feet. If you were to permit 18 units an acre, that allows at most a duplex. So we're not talking about putting 18 units on every single lot. We're 18 units an acre. So again, it's proportionate to the size of the lot. So that lot next door to you that's been vacant, if it gets IDZ1, you're talking at most two, not 18. I just want to make sure that's, that's communicated. And then just to kind of, kind of chime in, 18 units per acre is, is similar to our multifamily district, our lowest multifamily district, least intense one, which is MF18. Um, it is, it's a standard across the planning profession that 18 units per acre is a very low intense uh, uh, density, if you will. Uh, so as you progress higher, then you'll get to MF25, MF33, MF 
40, MF50, and MF65. Those are more intense, but MF18 is your least intense. But he's right, it's going to depend on the size of the lot. And you're right about the parking. Um, there's a lot of older neighborhoods that uh, were built before we had minimum parking requirements. And, there, and most of those are luckily in historic neighborhoods. So you'll also have that added uh, review process. If an IDZ project is proposed in a historic district, one of the requirements that they'll have to go through is go to HDRC for conceptual approval first of their project before proceeding through the rezoning process. Uh, so that way the neighborhood has another opportunity to see how it's going to look, how it's going to be parked. Uh, but again, it's going to be sensitive to the character of that historic neighborhood as well. We have a question here. Yes, I just wanted to, I worked on the IDZ task force with uh, Catherine and Logan, and I wanted to express to everybody here, I'm with uh, uh, Monticello and the Jefferson Neighborhood uh, Organization. Also, I helped work the uh, Jefferson uh, NCD, so we uh, developed that. And I think one of the things that, when I was in the, the meeting, or in the, the task force meeting, I found that there was frustration on both the neighborhood and the developers' uh, uh, standpoint that they could not take a look at some of these projects early on and that I think that's what this is addressing is that we can get a look the neighborhood can get a look we can get the rules down at the beginning and things don't slip through the cracks by being identified later on in the process so that was very important but one of the things I wanted to mention Kaz, uh, Kat was that uh, we did talk about the fact that a lot of the NCDs, especially because they have rules and they don't go through historic, was how we can get the neighborhood involved in this site plan process now and in the initial, uh, how they know what they're looking at. Because I know even developing our NCD standards, most of the people in our uh, district are not really, they don't feel capable of using our rules to interpret. So one of the things that we talked about, and I don't know that where we settled with this, is that maybe we could get the city to do some training with the neighborhoods and the NCDs to allow them to review these um, plans in the early on stages. Yes, if once adopted, uh, if adopted by council, uh, there will be an education effort. We uh, sort of like a roadshow, if you will, to those uh, neighborhoods, especially um, early on in the process in utilizing that. We're always welcome, uh, and, and we we ask that you invite us to your neighborhood association meetings if you're going to talk about a project that's going to be utilizing these new concepts so we can help facilitate those technical questions. Um, and then also, we'll probably feature this as um, a new uh, workshop in our DSD Academy as well. Uh, so we have a monthly uh, education uh, seminar, if you will. Um, and so once adopted, we'll feature that as part of that. So that way all of the neighborhoods can come and, and again, probably get something uh, similar to this uh, presentation and then go into a little bit more detail. I'll let... Oh. Hi. Uh, my name's Tammy. I recently had the pleasure of uh, working with my neighbors, updating our Alta Vista Neighborhood Association standards. It was a very positive process, interested in what's going on here today. Uh, my question is, does the IDZ override the NCD requirements? And number two, can uh, something be added to the developer end of things? I really liked what you had to say, Mr. Jefferson Monticello over there, about, <laughs> about uh, getting us involved earlier in the developer process, because that's an expensive, uh, it can be very frustrating when all of a sudden it's perceived that uh, they're just jumping on us, they don't want improvement, they don't want progress. No, that's not it. If we could just uh, perhaps add something that lets the developer know that contacting the neighborhood association and presenting to the neighborhood association early alleviates some roadblocks for everyone. 
I'll take the answer. Thank you. So uh, the first question ha is, has to do with the overlay district standards. So uh, Alta Vista is a neighborhood conservation district similar to Beacon Hill Neighborhood Conservation District. NCDs are similar to historic districts. It's an overlay district that has design requirements. Those overlay districts will supersede any of the setback development standards uh, that are within this IDZ or the R1, R2 uh, districts. So if uh, the, mi the minimum front setback for R1 is 10 feet, and um, you have a minimum setback in an NCD of 20 feet, they have to comply with the 20 feet. So the NCDs and the historic districts supersede the uh, standards of the IDZ. Because IDZ is your base district. That's basically going to tell you what your uses are. But it also gives you the minimum development standards if you are not within an overlay district. So hopefully that answers that first part of the question. And the second part is, again, as Logan mentioned earlier, we highly encourage our applicants when they come in to rezone uh, to meet with the neighborhood association as well as the property owners that are going to be notified early on in that process. And we let them know that if they don't, they run the risk of having their case continued by zoning commission, which adds time to their project. And as we all know, time is money. So uh, that's why we highly encourage them to meet early. And again, if you're not if you're not signed up to receive those email notifications, sign up on constant contact so you can receive that because you'll get notification early on that cases have been filed and you're able to go to that PDF report and look to see what street, what block, what district, and what the proposed use is. Follow up, Tammy. Uh, that's great. And, and a lot of us do get those emails. Do I need to speak into the board? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, we do get those emails, but that, again, uh, places the burden on the neighborhood association, which are volunteer and they are often, they're chasing after their lives, and it's really hard for us to chase after everything that comes across. Why not just place the burden back on the developer by saying, not saying we strongly suggest, but saying, this is part of your process. Please get in touch with the Neighborhood Association. That would be a policy decision that would have to be applied to all zoning districts that only council could make that policy decision on. So, but right now, again, yes. So right now we tell them, we highly encourage, and then our zoning commissioners who are part of this process too, utilize that as you haven't met with the neighborhood. Um, their neighborhood association meeting is next week. I want you to meet with the neighborhood. So I'm going to, I'm going to motion for a continuance. And there you go. There's two weeks added or maybe a month added to their process. So that's why we tell them right when they apply or right when they're coming in and they haven't applied yet, give them the name, the contact information, and let them know, contact them first. So uh, again, policy decision that council would have to make. Um, I would like to piggyback on the comments, the parking comments that the uh, King William Lavaca woman made and acknowledge that it is a serious, serious challenge and I um, would uh, encourage you to somehow put some conditions, criteria, or build on to your IDZ1 especially to address this. As you say, there is um, uh, minimum off-street parkings can be can be waived, okay? Well, when a case goes, let's use the example of 6,000 square feet, two duplexes, or one duplex. Um, chances are it's a two bedroom or something. Um, it goes to HDRC for approval first, and then they look at appropriateness. Fact is, if the applicant does not include parking for that, they don't review it. If you put a covered parking, a structure, then they review it. And they will admit that parking is not within their purview. It's not in this purview. So because it's not there, because it's space, not a place, it disappears. But in reality, that two-bedroom duplex will have minimum four cars. So I, I think it would be important to somehow, if you do have um, a category that has a waiver, is there a trigger or something that says, we have researched in terms of VIA, ride share, um, we have done a count on the street of existing parking spaces. I know some applicants in HDRC will show, um, oh, we did a traffic count, quote unquote traffic count, real casual thing, and show, oh, there's plenty of space. But there needs to be something that is accountable that shows the actual street right of way use 
in a particular neighborhood. King William Lavaca will be very different than Monticello, will be different than Dignity Hill. So it does need to be um, pretty closely considered. That would be, and I have one other question. How does the city or DSD define stories? I think it's the story, and Mike can probably help me out here. Um, I'll just give it to Mike. <laughs> right? Is he going to draw it? All right, good morning, everybody. So I'll take that. The definition of stories is the same definition that pretty much every city uses in terms of the building and development code. So a story is a floor and a roof. So that's it. And then when we talk about number of stories, if any part of that is below ground, meaning you have a sloped lot, there is a calculation that you will do uh, utilizing what's called the average ground plane or average grade plane. Really what that means without going through a lot of diagrams is if most of that, I come from the Northeast, we had basements, right? So as many of you probably know that, if most of that lowest story is below ground, meaning average grade plane and all that stuff, then that would be called an underground story. And you would start with the next story to you know, go up in terms of stories above grade plane. Uh, we also have the definition of half story, I believe, or, or half, uh, right? Uh, and then that's a square footage calculation of if it's uh, the floor area is half of that uh, footprint of the building. So there, but, but the, the simple answer is that we follow the international building code and the, the, the development codes that everybody else does. Um, and we can actually provide you some diagrams of how to do that. I, the joke is that um, I actually got up and drew that at one, and it was terrible drawing, but, um, but again, we, we, that standard is kind of nationwide. And you might want to measure how its height is measured within that story? Sure, and I'll mention height too, so that comes up a lot, the maximum height of a building. So if you have a flat roof, that's pretty easy, right? Uh, something like this, for example, we just measure to the, the roof. Uh, but when you have a peaked roof, so you take just a, a sloped roof, uh, you take the average height of the, from the peak uh, to the edge, you take that average elevation, and that will be your building height. Uh, and again, that follows the international and national building codes that we've adopted uh, locally here, because uh, we wanted to be consistent. That that's a, that's a national issue, right? Uh, and it's not just for the zoning regulations, but it's also for building code and fire code safety regulations as well. So it's all matched up. We can provide you uh, some some kind of further explanation on that to this group. It's, I think we have it on our website too, but we can get that out to you because that's that's key to a lot of this discussion that we're talking about, of course. Who's got the mic? Christy. Hi. Uh, so, um, of course, I work for District 1. Most of you know that. But I also live downtown, so I'm your neighbor. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the parking requirement and how the task force got to that conversation. Um, just because something is not required does not mean it cannot be added to the site plan. And so that would be a discussion for the Zoning Commission, for the, the City Council, the Planning Commission, to look at that site plan and that ground comparison form and say, well, wait a minute, you know, everything around you has parking or doesn't have parking or the street's this wide and, and it's more appropriate to have parking. The reason why we wanted to have a, a base um, zoning district that still waives parking is, is honestly for the restoration of a lot of historic landmarks. Because we have the Kelso House, the Hildebrand House, we had the, um, you know, the Lermis just down the street from here that we had to rezone to IDZ because they didn't have parking. And the alternative to that is to pave their lawns, right, which we don't want to do because they didn't have a driveway. And I don't have a driveway, so I, you know, I drive around King William and Mission, you know, uh, constantly looking for for parking when I get home from work and it's exhausting I, I hear what you're saying and so for those neighborhoods where it's needed and where it's appropriate um, yes that could be added to the site plan and that would hold them to it because it is on the site plan so I don't know if that helps at all we have uh, a question up front and we have two in the back so and then we have Barb here number four <laughs> Good morning, uh, Rose Hill, President of Government Hill. I got a question. Um, how many feet from the front 
setback on like in a commercial area do you have to have and the reason I'm asking that question is because we had an incident 825 Grayson where the site plan when it came to the neighborhood association was one way but I guess when they built it it was another way it ended up like almost one and a half feet we measured from the sidewalk which sticks out like a some sore thumb so after that's done, does the city go back and I know that, is there a final uh, check off from an inspector to make sure did this developer comply with the requirements as they indicated or the site plan to begin with and how did this change and how did this happen? So when that happens, it sort of kind of sets a back precedence for the neighborhood for the development because you don't know, are, is the developer going to change in the instance of saying this is the way it's going to be on the site plan because we requested IDZ and now we've changed it. So who goes back and actually makes sure that they are complying with what they're supposed to be doing? So there will be minimum setback requirements. Again, front uh, the front setback will be uh, dependent on the median block face, your rear of five, and your side perimeter of five. Um, so there is an inspection process. Uh, one of my staff um, reviews NCDs, um, as well as uh, the site plan requirements for conditional uses and specific use authorizations at Zeke Solis. Uh, so he goes out there to do one final check to be sure um, to, that they are in compliance with that approved site plan and if they have a conditional use or specific use authorization. And if these new IDZ districts uh, get adopted by council, that will be a part of his uh, review as well to make sure that they are complying with that. Tr inspections are triggered to him throughout the building process. So if they need to do a framing inspection, he'll be able to go out there along with the building inspector who's gonna look at the technical requirements of the framing. And then Zeke will look at the uh, requirements for the actual site plan and the distance that they were uh, they were approved for. So there will be an inspection process for this. We have a question back here. Okay. Um, hi, I'm uh, Grace Rose Gonzalez, Keystone Neighborhood Association and a former zoning uh, commissioner. And um, so the reason, you know, when, when I was on zoning and we pushed for this IDZ uh, reconsideration was because of the fact that uh, neighborhoods were not contacted ahead of time, especially some of the, you know, th these neighborhoods would be caught off guard and it wasn't a requirement. I, I really do believe, you know, and I know that, that you're saying, well, it would have to be a consideration for everything that's coming through, but I do believe that that on maybe IDZ is a different issue because of the fact that the neighborhoods are so compact. So, you know, we've talked about all of it. All of it. I mean, Keystone, uh, we can't, I mean, everyone parks on the street because, you know, we have small houses and small, you know, small driveways and all the rest of it. So I, I'm not sure if there's any way of making that a tick mark um, that, yes, you know, you have visited and, and, and as Tammy said, it, the owner isn't on the neighborhoods. Um, I just think that it's it's just IDZ is used because of the fact that we want to encourage, and it is. And, and but we don't, but we don't want to have negative impact either. And so it's a it's a truly a, a balancing act. And the reality is that a lot of these neighborhoods with these um, parcels that are are vacant. Um, you know, it, maybe maybe they don't really need IDC. Maybe it's single family dwellings that go back. Um, so, you know, in the crag, because I was part of the crag, at that time we really had, you know, that whole um, weed and seed program and things had been flattened out in uh, sections of Government Hill and Dinwiddie and all of these areas. So, you know, with Mayor Garza, we really worked at what would be those incentives. And I don't know if we need those incentives anymore. Yes, we talked about the notification right. process, yes. I know, I came in late, I'm sorry. Okay, we have a question back here. Hello, uh, my name is Max Woodward with the Uptown Neighborhood Association and Fredericksburg Road Economic Development Committee. Um, I don't particularly like coming to these meetings because it upsets me inside uh, when parking plays a central role to the conversation. 
And I'd like to remind you all that cars are a, are a luxury and a convenience that not everyone can afford. And so uh, when you're requiring developers to accommodate parking, uh, suggesting that you can't market any residential properties without parking, um, you're not addressing the people who need housing the most and that are suffering the worst in all of this rapid growth. Um, so is there any zoning class that allows you to build residential units without accommodating for parking? That's for those, what I For those see. people uh, right. who choose to or are not able to drive cars. So our current IDZ district is the one that uh, waives minimum parking requirements. IDZ 1, the lowest intensity, 18 units per acre, um, will still waive parking requirements. So there can be projects that can still waive the parking requirement. And for uh, other types of projects, there still is a process that anyone can request uh, to waive the minimum parking requirements without having to rezone to IDZ. And that's a Board of Adjustment waiver process so you can still go through a process to to waive minimum parking requirements okay thank you Question here. thank you I'm Mary Briscoe Cushman and I'd like to um, expand on what Rose Hill mentioned uh, in regards to the I have two questions if I may in regards to the construction and finding out afterwards you know that oh we blew it. Um, in a meet and greet with a particular developer, he indicated proudly, we'll just pay the fine. I feel that the, that is an attitude that is prevalent. And um, with that, the inspections need to be enforced. And if, in fact, reconstruction is necessary, so be it. And it is on the developer. There is a responsibility to the developer as well as to the neighborhoods. Um, also, these should these requirements pass in city council? Will these requirements be um, grandfathered into current IDZ uh, situations in which have not broken ground with proper notice? Um, and uh, amendments to current IDZ uh, classifications. Oh, so the first uh, part of your question had to do with uh, the inspection process. Somebody does, you know, builds it, mea culpa, I'm just going to go through the process. So yes, there's still a fine um, that they'll pay, but there still is the requirement to comply. So uh, we have the Board of Adjustment. We see a lot of these cases where um, a residential homeowner built a carport without getting a permit and said, I'll just pay the fine and then keep going. But the fine is not the end of it. They still have to comply. And they think that once they go to the through administrative uh, process to court, if you will, um, that they're done. They're not done. They're not done, so they still have to comply. And if the Board of Adjustment does not grant them that variance to maintain what they have, then they have to come into compliance. Uh, so if that means reconstruction, then they're gonna have to reconstruct it. If that means moving the post from the carport further in, they're gonna have to move it. Um, and so we try to educate them as much as we can, the contractors, to pull permits. But we do recognize that there are people that utilize family members uh, that to, uh, build something on their property, don't get the right permits um, that they're supposed to. Maybe they didn't realize they had to get a permit. Uh, and so, but we still have that process that we have to follow. And if approved by Board of Adjustment, then they're approved, but they've gone through the process. If not approved, then they have to comply. It's not the owner I'm concerned about, it's the developer. It's the same process applies to them too. Yes, right. yes, if so. They want every inch for, mm -hmm. you know, every penny. Yep, so they'll have to comply if they built it without a permit. So the second part of her question, remind me. Grandfather. Grandfather, okay, yes. So the current IDZ, uh, so projects that were already approved with the current IDZ will still comply with the current IDZ standards. These will, apl uh, will apply to new IDZ projects coming in uh, that rezone to these new districts. We have a question here and then a question in the back and your number three. <laughs> yeah. Short Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I had two parts of a question also. A lot of times what we're finding is that uh, when a, a 
building, a multifamily building goes up, all of a sudden the base goes like way up and then starts the stories. Is that why two and a half stories are 35 feet from the ground? Well, like Mike mentioned earlier, where that height, I mean, they, they'll still, if they have a, a larger foundation, it's because they have a sloped piece of property. Well, no, it's flat. Oh. Well. Because there's no, is there, there's no ordinance about how much fill you can put in to build, right? Yeah, that would, we'd have to look at that specifically. That just, usually we see those large foundations because a property is sloped and they need to elevate it. But if there's something that's flat and they build a high elevation, we'll have to look at that independently. And so we should just contact you. Yes. And the other one is about this project and the project changing. One thing that we've learned is to follow the project through permits. Because, yes, down at your office, things can change. And uh, so that's the one thing that we all think that once you win or lose, it's over. But the, the main thing is, at least we found, is to go meet with the staff, which are very good about doing that in your office, and find out how it works, which because a lot of people don't know, and then to follow the permits. And uh, it's, of course, a lot of work, but it seems to be a way to do that. I and you can follow that. along on the permits with our current system. Our current permit system is Hanson. You can create a, a customer account, and you can query certain addresses that you want to keep track of, and you'll see all of those permits uh, that are pulled online. As we move uh, forward to build a, say, we're replacing that software system, and so that Hanson system will re be replaced probably in about two years. Right now, our focus is on our land development areas, so we'll have a, a, an online system where you can track zoning cases, board of adjustment cases, our subdivision plat cases, all the things related to the horizontal development, and then we move forward through, to the vertical development for Build SA. Question here. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amelia Valdez, and I am with the Historic Westside Resident Association, so we're in New Kidding Town, but been in existence for a whole year been doing work on the west side. Uh, so our passionate people in the west side, it's one, it's one of our poorest districts, along with east, the east side. Uh, we've been working hard with no registration um, because they're denying us application registration. There's an overlap on the west side. It's real small. Uh, but there's a dispute, so I can't receive. So. You were checking. I was wondering if no, my I'm time. No, I'm sorry, I got buzzed. Sorry. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, um, my thought is if I can't get registered, I'm not receiving any information. And there's a policy we make here for us to, do, to receive that, and that won't be done till October, but then there's things that we have to resolve before October. Is that correct? So I can, our association can't receive any IDZ zoning as a part of registration, right? So we're now, not in the dark because I find my ways to find out things because other association members are nice enough to tell me. But there's a couple of points I would like to make real quick. And um, there was a word, Logan, that you talked about is sincere in intent of the developer. Don't know what that means. Um, Rose, thank you so much for making your points because sometimes we get notifications the next day and I'm going through the West Side just trying to get my folks together. Um, and then you talked about conversations of our neighborhoods. It's always building up. Building up has is, is, is always been a, a thing for uh, us in the neighborhood because some of our historic homes uh, get to be um, not restored, but they get, you know, before we know it, there's something going on and on the on the west side and we don't get it noted, not, no notification. Um, anyway, so I'm, I come here because it's very important that we get registered notified, first of all, and we won't be able to do that for a while now. We continue to do the work, we continue to fight. And I, I appreciate all the associates brothers and sisters that are here, that are here to um, help out. But we're in need, we're in desperate right now on the west side. And I'm very sincere about it because I've been born and raised in the west side. And why do, I'm doing the work there and we need, we need help. Well, Thank you. Let, yeah, the cat can point it out here. Let's, well, let's make it easier for you to track down some of this information. I understand you're trying to register a new neighborhood association. I assume you're working with the planning department for that. 
But as far as communications from our department are concerned, so upcoming zoning cases, this meeting, or sorry, our meeting on Monday night was communicated through constant contact. Right from our homepage, you can sign up and you can check. I want to be notified of various types of applications. And that way, every week for two weeks when we send those reports out, it goes straight to your email inbox. So that way you don't have to do all this legwork. We'll do it for you. I'm doing all that. Okay. Okay. My thing is the registration part and, and, and the denial of us getting some information. Because some of our folks well, don't have some of our folks don't have uh, the potential to go on computer. I may not have that access. Sure. We, uh, let's try to address that offline. We understand what direction you're coming from, so we can take that offline and, and uh, try to address okay. your situation. Well, okay. Show. But go ahead with the uh, website, please. Um, if you're if you're not in registered neighborhood association, you're, you're experiencing that difficulty. Again, anyone can go online to see what zoning cases are coming forward. You don't have to wait for that notification. Uh, so on the same web page is uh, on the far right under upcoming ordinances, tentative zoning cases. This is what you can click on um, in order to get the PDF report of applications that have been filed and uh, meeting uh, dates two weeks out. Uh, so we had an application deadline of last Friday um, and unfortunately we had four days of training uh, so we're still uh, verifying all of the cases but by Monday close of business this will be updated to reflect the two July meetings so right now it reflects June and the applications that have come in for July 3rd so now you can go online and, and take a look at what's been applied for the next one the next batch will have July 3rd featured and July 18th, somewhere around there? Yeah. So again, anyone can go here. You don't have to wait for notification um, to the Neighborhood Association, the snail mail, if you will. You can go on here and just check that every two weeks because we update it every two weeks. Kat, can you show uh, Legistar and the upcoming Zoning Commission agenda uh, for folks who are not aware of Legistar? Sure. The city's calendar? So on the sanantonio.gov website, on the far left corner is uh, city council and committee meeting agendas. The Legistar is the software application system uh, that the city utilizes for all boards, commission, and city council agendas. Uh, so once you click on that, then you'll get to this site and every single meeting and subcommittee meeting that council has um, are featured here. <clears throat> Here's the zoning commission agenda. Uh, so here is where you can click on the PDF of that agenda. Uh, once you get to the PDF of the agenda, um, every single case is listed. And you'll see on the side, this little blue ID number. Uh, this is the ID number for uh, that where the data is held in the system. Once you click on that, it will take you to the actual information. So here's the location map, here's the site plan, and there are two ways in which you can review the staff report. Here, it's a, it starts off with, it, it defaults to history, so you're not gonna see anything here. However, this tab here is text. Oh, it's a very sensitive mouse. Once you get there, then you can see the text of it, and then you can click here for the full text, or you can also go up here to reports. You know, let's see that there. You can click on report, you can get the agenda memo, same thing, but it's in a PDF format, and then you can print that from home. Comes up slowly, but it'll get there. See, there's a staff report. All this information is loaded online. Location map, site plan, and any other, if SAWS report, if it's over the recharge zone, we also load that up as well. So this is where you can get all the information, and our agendas are posted at a minimum 72 hours. We've typically done them on Fridays. Yeah, show them, go back to the main page, to the... Legistar main page. Okay. And show them how they can just filter just to see zoning oh, commission. Yeah. So here's where you can filter for um, the different types of boards, uh, uh, committees, that you, and you can, oh, there. I know. So you can just pull all of the agendas. Oh, it went too far. Uh, for that commission. So here, it'll automatically filter for just all zoning commission agendas. System's really easy to use, very friendly. And once you get into that agenda, once you click on that blue link, then you can start exploring. Okay, we have a question here. Hi, uh, Lulu Francois, Digna Woody Hill, neighborhood, well, sorry, Digna Woody Hill. Um, my question is twofold. Um, can you go back to your new RS1 and RS2 descriptions? Oh, you want to, I'll let you drive. Uh, 
Uh, and my question for these two standards is on parking. Again, I'm sorry. Sorry. Everything's parking. I know you hate it, but. They'll have um, to meet minimum parking requirements. I'm sorry? They'll have to meet minimum parking requirements, and just like all of our conventional zoning districts. Okay. So, so I guess that was my question, because we, again, we've run into issues. And, and I know that there's a lot of people, especially the younger people, who are not interested in parking because they are trying to you know, live closer to downtown. But when we start looking at these developments, and I'm telling you this is so you'll understand our perspective, you may not be living in that area your entire life, especially with some of these smaller lots and some of these smaller homes. You have younger people or even elderly people well, not elderly, more mature people who move in. See, no, we're not seniors, we're just empty nesters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what happens is that as when we're looking at this, we're saying, okay, so that's great. You've got a young couple, they want to live downtown, that's wonderful. But what happens is when they start having kids, I mean, we literally had someone say, well, I don't, I don't want to, I can't live here forever because once I have kids, I'm going to have to move because um, you're an SA. ISD, Dignity Hill is, right? So when we do this, we look at the future. What is the future? You know, it, you may not need it, but someone else may need it in the future as far as parking is concerned. And that's why we always look at minimum parking requirements. If you don't need it, great. You may not be living there your entire life. And that's some of the experience that we've dealt with because we do have the larger lots and we have the very small, tiny lots. My concern was... This is what we run into again with Indignity Hill. <clears throat> you are not allowed, according to HDRC, allowed to park in front of the house. And I just wanted to make sure that these two R1 and new R1 and R2 residential requirements require parking either on the side or on the back of a house as opposed to in front. And this is where you have the, we are the bad people because we're calling it out because HDRC does not talk to zoning and vice versa. So the, these, these new developers or new homeowners are getting two different messages. So for the R1 and R2, uh, acknowledging that it is a small lot, uh, there is in the code a minimum uh, garage setback requirement of 20 feet uh, from the front of the garage to the property line. It will be waived to allow them to park in front of their house. Now again, if it's zoned historic, they're still going to have to comply with the overlay district standards. All zoning will, re will require is what, this is your minimum base requirements. You'll have to park it. Where you park it is going to be based on that historic overlay. And, and I I think that's where the confusion and then the frustration comes into play where when they finally are talking to the neighborhood association like the old arc versus the new arc right is where you're saying we don't agree with that we don't like the fact that you're trying to park your car in front of your house it doesn't meet um, historic guidelines. So for R1 and R2, there's no site plan requirement, just like the other residential districts, R4, R5, and R6. So right now, if they request R1 and R2, it's just about the legal use of the property. Okay. And then once they do that, they'll still have to go through that approval process. But okay. early on in the process for any applications within our historic or Rio districts, we send a copy of that application to uh, Office of Historic Preservation so they're aware of it and it's on their radar. Okay. And then we let the applicant know that they'll still have to comply with those Rio or historic standards. Okay. Uh, so if it behooves them to go through some sort of con conceptual site plan uh, process to HDRC to make sure that they can still do it. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify. And then the second question I had is, I'm sorry. Was that my third question? I'm sorry. Um, I think a lot of us have our uh, neighborhood established neighborhood plans. How are are y'all? Is your is your office adhering to our individual neighborhood plans as a voted on it approved by the residents of the neighborhoods in whatever year it was approved? Yes. Yeah, so part of the rezoning requirement requires us to look at any adopted neighborhood community uh, perimeter or sector plans, and as those plans are getting uh, replaced by regional center or community plans to the SA tomorrow planning process, there is a land use um, component within each plan, and each uh, and that land use component that approval 
approval process will apply a land use designation to every property that's within those boundaries. So our rezoning process requires us to look at is the zoning district that they're requesting to rezone to consistent with that land use category that is de designated on that piece of property. And if it is, then they can rezone the property without having to do a plan amendment. So that is a requirement right now that we have to make to maintain whether or not they are required to get a plan amendment to change that plan, which is another public input process that uh, piggybacks on the rezoning process. So yes, the plans are in place and the plans will continue to be in place. And as the new adopted plans are uh, adopted, then we continue to do that consistency requirement review. We have a question here, and then we have a question in the back row. If I could go mind, most of your main to what was just said. I go mine is too, so there. <laughs> well, then you go first. Ladies first. Ladies first. Um, uh, my neighborhood is in uh, the, the very center of the uh, proposed uh, Midtown Regional Center. Um, we have... Uh, there are five neighborhoods involved. Uh, one of them, I know for sure, has met uh, about their plan, their neighborhood plan. Uh, we have one uh, scheduled for Monday. Um, I know in looking over the plan that an awful lot of it is narrative, but it's narrative about land use. That we also have a land use map. And I, I, I find it difficult to understand how the city is going to educate the neighborhood, the neighbors who are supposed to be putting these plans together or changing these plans uh, and, and, and the new categories. It's, uh, what's the process? How is it gonna happen? Um, you know, what, what do you think? <laughs> uh, and and what, what is the time frame we're talking about? For the essay tomorrow plan implementation? Well, with the new land use categories, it has to have a new land use categories. Right, so I think that they've gone through the process already, the public input process to get the feedback. Yeah. Okay, all right, so the new land use categories are going to comprehensive planning committee on Wednesday, and then, and then council will consider those and hopefully approve those land use categories on Thursday. Once those are approved, then those are the new land use categories that are gonna be utilized through that regional uh, center plan process and community plan process. Okay, we have, pardon me for interrupting, but, but as I said, our neighborhood has two meetings, that's all. One of them is with the plan team, and that's Monday, and the other one is at the end of this month with the entire, you know, the public meeting. And that's it. So what are you suggesting? I, I, I'm not really sure, but we need education. I we would need... let them know on Monday uh, when you meet with them, especially the planning department, the team leads that are working on that, that you'd like more. Con find out what the rest of that public input is because they'll still have to go through an approval and adoption process. They typically go through an open house process too once they get the input. But talk to them on Monday about uh, what that full uh, component for the public input process and the community engagement process is and then ask them if you need more, then you need more. Just let them know. Uh, one thing I'll add is we'll, we'll talk to Bridget to make sure, the planning director, to make sure that their website is updated, um, so that way this information is available for everyone. So, with the... Um, we don't have computers or internet. Understood. Colin, here. Thank you, Tony. Uh, with that, and as much as uh, an observation is a question, with uh, the IDZ getting some new categories, I'm thinking of our neighborhood plan, and specifically, those categories didn't exist, so it's just known as IDZ. I'm just getting, trying to get prepared and giving everybody a heads up. It might be a while before IDZ 1, 2, and 3 come into the neighborhood plan, and with that, I'm sure there's going to be a developer come into you guys and be talking about IDZ. How are we going to un... Tangle. Well, it says IDZ here, but y'all are saying IDZ 1, 2, and 3. So it's going to depend on the density and the uses. So if your land use category right now has a land use designation of medium density residential, medium density residential allows MF18. So for us, IDZ 1 could be consistent if all they're doing is a duplex. So it would be consistent with medium density or um, the low intensity. Thank you. I was just bringing awareness of I could already see this being played against each other and 
Right, because a lot of the plans, and I'll tell you, a lot of the plans today do not have IDZ listed as a uh, district within their categories. But IDZ is a special district. So again, we have to look at what the density is proposed and what the intensity is proposed for uh, the uh, business uses and fit that in with that land use category. If the current land use category doesn't fit, the doesn't allow for C1, for IDZ1, then they'll have to go a step up. Maybe it's community commercial. But we do that today. We have another question here, and then we follow. Here we go. Alejandro Soto, Woodland Lake. We have uh, two NCDs in one historic district in our area. I've seen the Planning Commission go ahead and amend our, our community plan, even though we're against it. I've seen Board of Adjustment throughout NCD and historic uh, regulations just because they feel like it. So what's going to keep our IDC standards intact? So um, Planning Commission, <laughs> Planning Commission and Zoning Commission, they're recommending bodies only when it comes to land use and zoning. City Council is the final decision. Uh, for Board of Adjustment, for variances uh, to those development standards, the Board of Adjustment is the final authority, um, but they listen to that testimony uh, provided at the public hearing. Uh, I have seen them deny, and Beacon Hill can, can attest to that, deny uh, certain variances, including one that was just in Mankey Park as well in the NCD. They've denied certain variances uh, that weren't uh, consistent or within the character of the neighborhood. It just depends on, on uh, what goes on during that public hearing process. But there is, there has to be an option for um, an applicant or a homeowner to be able to ask for permission to do something that doesn't meet those standards. Um, and there is that public input process. Again, we notify property owners within 200 feet for Board of Adjustment and zoning cases to allow that public input and that community engagement to occur. But there has to be a process. And all we do is we facilitate that applicant through the process, but we encourage neighborhood associations or property owners who may not like what's being requested to speak or submit uh, their support or opposition. If I could, if I could just chime in real quick, Tony. Um, we, you know, we are we oversee all several boards and commissions: um, Planning Commission, Zoning Commission, and Board of Adjustments. Our Zoning Commission and our Board of Adjustments are district appointed. Um, so please pay attention to when these uh, appointments are vacant. The seats are vacant for these. Um, uh, districts because then we are looking f to fill those and the problem is that sometimes we don't have people to fill them so please pay attention to when those are happening the Planning Commission is at large we send out information out to our all of our social media and I know we need to work on trying to find efforts and ways to reach out to people that do not have access to social media uh, we also put information on our website so th these are options or ways that you can participate in the conversation and we also have our Planning Commission Technical Advisory Committee. They are the ones that actually look at all of our regulations and codes, and so it is very helpful if we have citizens serve on those as well. I, yeah, I did want to add one more thing uh, along your uh, line of inquiry. One of your concerns was that the Board of Adjustment can just modify it. They can just change it. To be clear, when we're talking about IDZ 1, 2, 3, and you're showing on that site plan, I'm going to have a 10-foot front setback, the Board of Adjustment cannot modify that. That's a condition imposed by City Council. So in this process, what you're being shown on these sort of site plans, it is going to be held to those standards. The Board of Adjustment can modify development standards in, in, in the Unified Development Code. They cannot modify conditions imposed by Council. It would require so. That, yeah, the, thank you, Kath. The, the, if, if someone said after the fact, no, I've got the zoning and I have the site plan and I want to modify that, then you're going through an amendment process which could, could very well trigger a full rezoning of the property all over again. We have a question back here. Uh, I want to bring up the elephant in the room. Uh, earlier we talked about uh, our neighbors who maybe build their carport the wrong way and we kind of put it back there. The, the elephant I want to address is disingenuous developers. Um, I think the message that we have here is that we must be vigilant. Um, I have a situation in my neighborhood. They threw everyone out of affordable housing in 2015, and it's still going on. And they were just shut down again last week. 
This is after going through, they, they have willfully ignored uh, getting their permitting. They have, and I'm not suggesting this is all developers at all. My frustration is that I think that we as neighborhoods, and I think this is part of what is fueling this, is that we continue to have people who aren't performing in good faith, either with the neighborhood or with the city. This guy that got shut down again was shut down because they said, oh, we're filling potholes. It's okay. No, they weren't filling potholes. They stood at the DSD desk downtown and lied. <laughs> they had scraped their parking lot and they had come back in with cold pack and a little bit of oil and that was going to be the parking lot for the apartment building. Okay? Thank you, Zeke. It got shut down. It got shut down because of the work of DSD. It wouldn't have gotten shut down if there hadn't been a question from a resident who had their eye on the project. So again, I'm sorry if this is a bit of a lecture. I appreciate what you guys are doing. You know that about me. Uh, but developers could be pushed just a little bit more. I'll reiterate that if we could make that part of policy. I understand council may have to act on that. but that. They are not just suggested, but required to speak and communicate. Because honestly, I can only speak for Alta Vista, but we are open to discussions. Show in good faith. That's all we're asking. They Thank you very much air? for your comment. Did they, did they turn off the air? <laughs> Well, we still have a few minutes, so we're not done yet, I guess. <laughs> I know we all want We have a question in, in the front here. Let me ask a question, though. Uh, we have shown the audience uh, how to get to the updates on, uh, on uh, IDZ, correct? Yes, so that's what uh, we have on our screen right now. So okay. all of the work of the task force and the proposed amendments, as well as this PowerPoint presentation, is on this website. It will be loaded on this website after today. Uh, to get there, you go uh, to sanantonio.gov slash DSD. Uh, once you get there, you go to resources, then go to codes and ordinances. Once you click on that, uh, then you're going to see all of the uh, current um, uh, projects or uh, policies that we're working on, including short-term rental. Uh, but for zoning updates, you'll You'll see that our Alta Vista NCD, which was uh, just uh, approved recently this last month, um, and then our infill development zone has a page as well, as well as the work that we're doing with Mankey Park on updating their NCD. So here's where all of the work of the um, task force ha has occurred, all of the documents for every single task force meeting. Uh, we started with the task force back in October. We've had about seven task force meetings, as well as about six general meetings uh, to receive in input as we've progressed through this process. And so all of that information is posted on here, including the most recent versions of the proposed changes uh, to the code. So you'll see the documents if you want to go to one of the documents, and you can kind of see it live. Um, so the way we show our uh, changes, our proposed changes, is um, for new text, we underline it and put it in blue. And for uh, text that we are striking, we strike it out in red. So you'll be able to see a live document that shows what those changes are. The PowerPoint is just supposed to summarize the information, and this is the codified language that us code geeks do and work on. Ms. Kat, is the PowerPoint that we presented today online? It will be online uh, starting Monday. Okay. Before I hand over the microphone to a last question, we want to make sure we have time for STR, a small STR update or presentation. Uh, Tony, if you would have time for that. Uh, let, me, let me hand over the mic one more time. Um, I just had a question about um, is it possible or is it already included or would it be possible to include um, traffic impact assessments with these zoning ordinances? 
or so, other impact assessments? So for IDZ, the current IDZ waives uh, traffic impact analysis for uh, rezoning and throughout the process. A traffic impact analysis uh, is required uh, depending upon if they reach a certain peak hour trip uh, for the project. And the peak hour trip that they have to meet is 76 peak hour trips. Um, it's based on a national standard. Uh, and so the traffic impact analysis would be required, but it's not required during a rezoning process. It's a very expensive process uh, because you have to hire engineers and you have to do the report and could cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And we, typically that is waived for the uh, subdivision plat and or a building permit process. Because first you got to find out, can I actually do the project? That's what the rezoning is about. Um, and so uh, some of those that are uh, deeply into the project and have the ability to do a TIA will do some sort of type of traffic impact analysis. Maybe not the full TIA report, but at least they'll get an idea of what uh, type of mitigation they might be uh, required to do. But it's not a requirement in the rezoning, because again, you're just trying to find out, can I legally do what I, I want to do? And then as, if you are approved and you move through that process, then you have to do the analysis if required to. I'm going to be real quick because I know we're trying to get over to Tony. Uh, anyone else, if you do have questions, right from this website here, my name, Logan Sparrow, that's the link. You hit that button. You can email me any question. My phone number is right underneath it, 210-207-8691 uh, if you have any questions that weren't able to be answered today. Please, anytime, shoot me an email. Give me a call. Glad to talk. Yeah, before I turn it over to Tony, uh, drainage, I think, is another in issue for uh, infill development. So if we have any questions with regards to drainage and water control, run off things such as that we'll send you them. okay yeah if you can just pull up the, the website done, yeah. okay. I'm Tony Feltz I'm the interim policy administrator with development services I see a lot of faces that I recognize from working on this process if you guys remember we've been working on a an ordinance to regulate short-term rentals in the city of San Antonio for a little over a year now um, we're slowly but surely trying to get that uh, initiative to the finish line and for those of you who aren't familiar with short-term rentals what we're talking about are the vacation rentals you know your Airbnbs um, those types of those types of things um, so just to give you a little bit of background um, like I said a little over a year ago former councilman Gallagher had gave us a direction to look at short-term rentals in the city of San Antonio. Um, we went through a process with a stake uh, a task force, a short-term rental task force. There are several members of the task force here in the room today. Um, we had several general meetings and we presented an ordinance to city council on April the 11th. Um, we got some really good feedback from council on April the 11th. And um, with working with um, the mayor's office and uh, District 1, particularly Kristen McCain, she's here as well with us today, um, we've proposed some modifications to that short-term rental ordinance to try to address some of the concerns that neighborhood coalitions and neighborhood groups like yourselves have presented to us, as well as some of the concerns that the um, short-term rental industry has presented to us. Um, things like density, things like uh, um, fees, um, event uses, not, uh, not allowing event uses at those short-term rentals, um, things like that. And uh, we have had a task force meeting and another general meeting. We will have another general meeting on June 28th um, to go into detail about that. So I wanted to let you know that'll be at our um, development services building, 1901 South Alamo. Please join us. Um, okay. We'll be there. That's um, on a it's June 28th, that's on a Thursday evening, that's what I was looking for, Thursday evening at uh, 5.30, so you don't have to come out on a Saturday. <laughs> you can come out. You like Saturday? Our last one was on Saturday. Um, and also we'll be at Governance to get some feedback from um, uh, part, a portion of the City Council. That'll be um, next Wednesday, June the 20th. Um, that meeting is at noon. But um, if you still have questions, if you want to get some more information, I encourage you to come to our general meeting on the 28th. Come to Governance if you can um, on Wednesday. Um, we also have uh, a website. You can get to it the same way that you can get to uh, the IDZ 
uh, changes. Um, Logan, can you show them how to get there? So it's a different tab. So it's under codes and ordinances, and you see there short-term rentals, and we have all that information. Um, we've got all of our public comments there, as well as the task force members, upcoming meetings, you know, as well as um, some of the documents. And um, my email address is on there. If you read through that, you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, I believe we're at the end of our uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the audience. We have a fantastic group here with some great questions. I know some of some questions have not been totally answered, and we'll get to the bottom of the questions, but we really want to thank your attendance on, on a Saturday morning. We want to thank Kat, Logan, Tony, Melissa. And Chrissy, Chrissy McCain for, for their, uh, uh, spending their Saturday morning uh, and trying to educate and present information our way. And let's wish Melissa a happy birthday because today's her birthday. Oh, Melissa, it's happy birthday today. <laughs> and I'm not going to sing. Put your donation at your Christmas party. We also want to thank uh, Nowcast SA for recording this particular presentation. Uh, they will have a link on the uh, Tier 1 uh, Facebook, so if you want to review the presentation, uh, you know, that information is out there. Transparency is out there. We want to get the information out to you folks, and uh, also I've been told if you have signed our uh, signing sheet, you will be receiving uh, some email notifications. Uh, I think Ricky has some comments. No, I just, I just wanted to say that uh, we have very, very good turnout today. Uh, 22 neighborhoods are represented uh, and six council districts. So this is a topic that has great interest in the city. Thank you so much. Again, thank you very much for being here on the Saturday morning. Bye-bye.